Tonight, a mass killer's final moments. New revelations about the capture and death of Miles Sanderson. The drugs found in his system. He took his own life, which was the easy way out for him. And his last words. The spread of online hate. A troubling new snapshot of the rise in cyber harassment for young Canadians. These platforms need to be accountable. Also, the new and urgent appeal for bystanders to stop filming violent incidents and call police instead. This behavior is inappropriate. Plus, inside the final hours of a historic but shortened mission to the moon. Once it gets dark, its solar panels are going to die. And serving up surge pricing. I don't think that's right. Bad idea. The frosty reaction as Wendy's adds a new cost to the menu. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. The last moments of a mass murderer were revealed today at a coroner's inquest in Saskatchewan. A detective telling the jury that Miles Sanderson told his arresting officers at the end of the three-day manhunt, quote, nobody even shot at me, man, and asked them how many people he had killed. And for the first time, we also learned about Sanderson's cause of death today, which, as CTV's Allison Bamford explains, even surprised seasoned toxicologists. For myself, I can start my healing now, knowing all the, all the facts and all the information that I needed to know. Daryl Burns felt relief when Miles Sanderson died in custody, not because he wished him dead, but because the sense of danger was gone. If he went to prison, there was always a chance that he could get parole again and come back out. An inquest into Sanderson's death outlined his autopsy results. The mass killer overdosed on cocaine just minutes into his arrest, three days after brutally killing 11 people. Toxicology reports found very high levels of the drug in Sanderson's system, more than 10 times the average amount associated with a fatal cocaine overdose. Arresting officers seized a bag of coke and a rolled up $20 bill from Sanderson's hand, but never saw him ingest the drugs before he was handcuffed. The testifying pathologist couldn't confirm when Sanderson would have taken it. Agencies a part of this process really did their due diligence and to the best of their ability. But in the same breath, there are parts of these systems that could be improved. Despite officers ramming the killer off the highway at 139 kilometers an hour, both the autopsy and police investigation found no signs of trauma, and there's no indication that the RCMP's actions caused or contributed to his death. Sanderson showed no remorse for his actions moments before losing consciousness, asking officers, how many bodies did I get, and repeatedly telling police, you should have shot me. To me, he was looking for fame, you know, looking for some kind of recognition. Community members say there's a long history of oppression against First Nations and believe Sanderson's actions are linked to that trauma. At the end of the inquest, a jury will make recommendations and members of the James Smith Cree Nation hope some of them will address the root cause of addictions and community violence. Omar? All right, Alison Bamford in Saskatoon tonight. There is also a dramatic surge in online aggression. And new numbers today reveal that the vast majority of cyber-related hate crimes, 82%, are violent. And those are just the ones that are reported. The data comes a day after the government released its online harms bill. And tonight we take a closer look at the provisions dealing with hate. Here's CTV's Michael Couture. What I'm seeing out there uh, with the youth, it's very, it's very discouraging. Something Leah really, Parsons is all too familiar uh, with really cyberbullying and online hate. 11 years ago, her daughter Retea was taken off of life support after she attempted to take her own life. Photos of a group sexual assault involving Retea were circulated online, leading to daily torment. And now her other daughter is experiencing uh, cyberbullying. I have a 14-year-old daughter who has been violently attacked. It's been videoed, it's been shared on platforms, on social media. She says the platforms won't take the videos down. 
Meanwhile, a new Statistics Canada report shows teens make up nearly one quarter of victims of cyber-related hate crimes. That same report says in 2022, 71% of young Canadians have seen online content that incites hate or violence. Cyber-related hate crimes in Canada more than doubled between 2018 and 2022. Not only because of the degree of vitriol content that's happening and the polarization that's happening online, but because there are no checks and balance against it. Hashim believes the government's online harms bill is a good first step as it increases sentences for spreading hate on the internet. We need to establish baseline standards to protect the safety of Canadian children and to protect vulnerable people from hatred. The law would create a five-person digital safety commission which could compel social media platforms to remove damaging content or risk millions in fines. While some experts applaud the government's efforts, they're also preaching patience. I don't think we can just flick a switch and have a full running enforcement arm with all the rules set up. It's going to take time. In a statement to CTV News, Meta, the parent company of Facebook, says it supports the goal of protecting young people online. Omar? All right, Mike, thanks. There is an urgent new warning from police tonight about a trend that's potentially endangering lives. CTV's Adrian Gobriel explains. From a stabbing on board a Toronto subway to smash and grabs caught on camera, violent viral videos on social media are commonplace. Have been filmed and circulated on social media. And now one of Canada's largest police services west of Toronto and Peel region is raising the alarm by posting a public awareness message that claims too many people are filming violent incidents, posting the footage online while neglecting to call 911. Seeing your loved one in their most vulnerable state when they have been seriously injured, when they are dying, or in some cases when they have died, is something that no one should ever experience. While police declined to share specific smartphone videos like this of a man wielding a sword during a brawl serve as an example. In one case, police claim a passerby took footage of a man on the ground following a serious motorcycle crash. Instead of helping, they posted the video on TikTok. This behavior is inappropriate, repugnant, and extremely disrespectful to those impacted. When you think of it from the police perspective, their goal is to imagine a community where the members of that community are helping them, working with them to keep that community safe. However, the people on the streets seem to have a very different sort of motivational system at play. Psychology people professor working. Steve Jordans points to the post-pandemic world as a driving factor. As more people work remotely and more young adults communicate on devices, many are viewing the world around them through clicks and videos. And as we live more isolated, our focus on the societal level, on the community level, kind of decreases and our focus on ourself increases. They're not as community-minded as, say, they may have been 30 years ago. According to Professor Jordan's, the dopamine hit some get from the likes on their social pages has left many addicted, trolling public places like this, phone in hand, waiting for their next viral video with little to no regard for public safety. Omar. All right, Adrian, thanks. A Canadian tourist survived after he drove his rental car off an 18-meter cliff in Hawaii. The 27-year-old apparently took a wrong turn on a narrow remote road at 3.30 in the morning. Witnesses say the Jeep landed upside down on the rocks below. He plummeted into the water. A rescue crew in a chopper was able to save the man. A long-awaited bill on national publicly funded medication has some provinces at odds with Ottawa days before it is tabled. The first thing I would say is everybody just needs to take a pause. Um, you know, for provinces to say whether or not they're going to participate in something or not when they don't even know what it is, is a little premature. That reaction came from the federal health minister after Alberta and Quebec said they will opt out, insisting their provinces should be given control. Saskatchewan and Ontario are waiting for more details. The federal government and NDP reached a deal on the bill last week after months of negotiations. And negotiations for a ceasefire in the Middle East are ongoing, even though both sides in the conflict are downplaying the U.S. president's optimism. Israeli officials say they were caught off guard by Joe Biden's claims of a breakthrough deal by Monday. And Hamas says there are still major gaps. Here is CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver. After nearly five months of fighting, a pause may be near. The U.S. president says he hopes a ceasefire will be announced by Monday. You've got a, at least a principle agreement. There will be a ceasefire while that takes place. 
Ramadan's coming up, and there's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. Negotiators are in Qatar this week, trying to pin down the terms of that draft agreement, which builds on discussions last week. We are pushing hard for the proposals put forward and the agreement that took place in Paris to, uh, to take uh, place. Israel has reportedly agreed to a 40-day ceasefire, but Hamas is still considering the proposal. The deal reportedly includes the release of 40 Israeli hostages, as well as 400 Palestinian detainees. 500 aid trucks a day would be allowed into Gaza, and both sides would stop all military operations, with the IDF moving troops out of densely populated areas. Mr. Biden was getting a little ahead of events, because it does sound as if the, uh, the two parties to the conflict are actually still fairly far apart. And Israel's prime minister today suggested he would continue the war until complete victory, saying he has consistently resisted international pressure to end the war ahead of its time. Israel has signaled it intends to launch a ground offensive in Rafah, where residents appear mixed on their desire for a ceasefire. If the truce is like the previous one and they would start war again after it is over, we don't want it, this man says. This woman says she hopes it will be a permanent ceasefire. We don't want to go back to war. The last ceasefire deal in November collapsed after just seven days, with accusations of bad faith, Omar, coming from both sides. All right, Annie, thank you. And there are no signs the biggest war in Europe since the Second World War will end anytime soon. Key members of NATO, including Canada, have rejected an idea floated by the French president at a crisis meeting in Paris. CTV's Heather Wright is in Poland tonight on the diplomatic disruption and the response. Heather. Omar, the idea of sending NATO troops into Ukraine has rarely been discussed publicly. The alliance trying to avoid being dragged into a wider war with Russia. And after comments made by French President Emmanuel Macron, many member states, including Canada, have been quick to shut the idea down. At a meeting of Western allies yesterday in Paris, Macron said nothing can be ruled out when it comes to sending soldiers to fight in Ukraine. These comments drew a swift rebuke from the Kremlin, which warned that a direct conflict between NATO and Russia would be inevitable if combat troops were deployed in Ukraine. Germany, Poland, NATO and Canada among the countries to rule out troop deployment, with the defense minister's office saying in a statement, we will continue to provide Ukraine with comprehensive military assistance, but as a NATO member, Canada has no plans to deploy combat troops to Ukraine. And while NATO and other allies were quick to deny any plans, the conversation was unsurprisingly welcome to the Ukrainians, who said even discussing the idea shows there is an awareness about the risk posed by Russia, which continued to advance further into Ukraine today. Officials say troops retreated from two more villages as President Volodymyr Zelensky traveled to Saudi Arabia to meet with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Talks aimed at finding an eventual path to peace as well as securing a prisoner of war exchange between Ukraine and Russia. Right now, NATO only provides non-lethal support to Ukraine, though many member states provide weapons and ammunition. Any decision to send troops, though, would have to be unanimous. And based on the comments made today, that does not appear likely in the near future. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. And the future of the first American spacecraft to land on the moon in more than 50 years is coming to an abrupt end. CTV's Garrett Barry on why the multi-million dollar failure is still being considered a success. Engineers in Houston are racing against time tonight to get more data off of the moon before their transmissions go quiet. Their lunar lander Odysseus is dying. In fact, it may already be dead doomed by a flubbed landing that put the spacecraft on its side. Caught a foot in the surface and the, and the lander has tipped like this. And we believe this is the, surf, the, the orientation of the lander on the moon. Solar panels are pointed in the wrong direction and so are the antennas, which makes transmission even slower. Earlier today, Intuitive Machines, the company that spent $100 million to build the lander, estimated there were only a few hours left before Odie's battery is depleted. The mission has captured and transmitted these images taken while Odysseus was still in flight, approximately 30 meters above the moon's surface. 
the real take home message with any space mission is it's about the journey. It's about those, those failures. It's about the successes. It's about the whole trajectory. And we're all making our way into the future together. And I think if you're not at least celebrating part of it, I think you might be missing the point. These pictures show the South Pole region of the moon is the first time anything's gotten so close. It's alluring to researchers and astronauts this region could even have frozen water. It could be key for future exploration. Just because the mission failed doesn't mean there was a, a big suitcase with millions of dollars in it that got left on the moon. We spent that money. We're learning from that investment in the future. Four, three, two. The team behind this lunar mission will speak again tomorrow, where it's expected they will release more photos from the moon. Gare Perry, CTV News, St. John's. Nearly 22 years after Star from the world of rap music was killed, two men were found guilty in his murder. That's Run DMC's Jam Master Jay performing with the group at Live Aid. They helped hip hop become mainstream in the 1980s. But in 2002, the pioneering DJ was gunned down in his recording studio. Prosecutors allege it was revenge for a failed drug deal. Coming up. Because I pay my rent, uh, I don't have money. The growing number of Canadians going hungry. Plus, the beef over Wendy's new price surge. Food banks across the country are painting a dire picture tonight of the hardships impacting a growing number of Canadians. More people are being forced to turn to charities that are already struggling and failing to cope with demand. CTV's Mike Walker has more. The long lines are a regular occurrence outside the Fort York Food Bank. I feel pressure. Christian Herrera is lining up for the first time after recently being laid off from his construction job. Uh, because I pay my rent, uh, I don't have money. Food banks and charities have been experiencing unprecedented demand, a demand that will only rise this year, according to a new report from Second Harvest. Nonprofits across the country are bracing for an 18% increase in demand. That translates to 1 million Canadians who will access a food charity program for the first time. A lack of affordable housing and financial financial support for people on top of persistent inflation and inadequate wages has made life beyond difficult for so many. A lifeline for Olina, a mother of three who fled the war in Ukraine in June 2022. She says every month it's a difficult choice of paying for bills or groceries. We'll spend more on um, food. It will lead to some delays with rent payments, for example. But charities are buckling under the pressure of the 1,400 nonprofits surveyed across the country. 36% were forced to turn people away last year. In Toronto, that number is even higher at 50%. Because of limited resources, we had to limit our catchment area. Nonprofits are calling on the federal government to expand the GST grocery rebate and bring back the surplus food rescue program. There's more than enough food in Canada to feed everybody for five months for free. We don't have a food problem. We have a distribution problem. The report also found that charities will need an additional $76,000 each to match the demand. Mike Walker, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, striking out. Controversy and complaints over new Major League uniforms. What's being described as a personal matter kept Prince William from a memorial service for his godfather today. Kensington Palace did not elaborate on the reason, but said that his wife Catherine is recovering well from abdominal surgery. In the absence of the king, who is being treated for cancer, Queen Camilla led members of the royal family at the service for the late king of Greece. The royals are also mourning Thomas Kingston, who was married to the daughter of Queen Elizabeth's cousin. The 45-year-old was found dead in Gloucestershire on Sunday. And the Kansas City Royals have won their pitch for a special exemption to Major League Baseball's new uniform standard. The names and the numbers have shrunk to Lilliputian size. You can see the Nike logo of this guy's like spandex under his pants. 
Redesigned uniforms featuring sheer pants and smaller lettering caused an uproar online. The team's the only one to keep the old lettering. Now to a fascinating underwater discovery, the mighty sound of a miniature creature. That clicking noise comes from one of the world's smallest fish, the size of a fingernail. If you heard it up close, it would be as loud as a gunshot. These fish live in the murky streams of Myanmar, where they're hard to see. The fish don't make sounds whether by themselves, only when they're with other fish. So we're quite sure that it's some sort of communication signal. And in case you're wondering, only the males communicate this way. Ominous sound and also ominous today, a rare and intense winter thunderstorm that rolled through Toronto. Check out the wild weather captured in this time lapse video, condensing 30 minutes worth down to 40 seconds. Clouds sweeping over the skyline and plunging the city into darkness. After the break, paying a premium, a popular fast food chain serves up flex pricing. The fast food chain Wendy's is spicing things up by sinking their teeth into dynamic pricing, a popular practice that charges different prices for the same items based on demand throughout the day. And it's already getting a bit of a frosty reception. Here's CTV's Joy Melvin. So just how much are you willing to pay for a Wendy's cheeseburger or the new Baconator? The difference in price may depend on the time of day. Wendy's will test a new marketing strategy next year called dynamic pricing. Like airlines, Uber and Lyft ride sharing, prices at the burger chain will fluctuate, charging higher prices when demand is high, like lunch and the dinner rush hour, and less when demand is low. Wendy's is experimenting with this test to try to really make more money and uh, lower operating costs. I think it's not going to work. I think it'll be perceived through society as being greedy. And before you can say, where's the beef? People are asking, where's the fairness? <laughs> okay, bad idea. <laughs> bad idea. But again, I would say fast food is a bad idea. I can always go for a frosty with some uh, a large fry as well. But if they have surge pricing, will you still order it? Uh, it's going to be tough. I think it's a great business strategy. I think for, as a consumer, I think it's crazy. Wendy says it's just trying to stay competitive and profitable in the fast food industry, investing $20 million to launch digital menu boards so customers can see what their meal will cost in real time. I don't think anyone's going to pay extra for the exact same thing that they were getting for less. Uber fying fast food is a risky move, say marketing experts. The burger backlash on social media is harsh, accusing Wendy's of gouging themselves out of business. There are even threats of a boycott. And fear that other fast food chains could follow and put surge pricing on its menus. It's a lot to chew on. Joy Malbin, CTV News, Washington. We'll see if it works. And that's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.